makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. UBS scraps the Swiss government backstops that helps seal its Credit Suisse takeover, including a 9 billion franc loss protection deal. U.S. core CPI posts the smallest back-to-back -back gains in more than two years, raising prospects of a Fed pause. Plus, the U.K. economy actually surprises with the strongest quarterly growth in more than a year. So let's take a look at the European markets map to actually have a look at some of the assets that we're looking out for. You can see, for the moment, we're seeing a bit of pressure with uh, the FTSE down 7 tenths of percent Similar losses across the board with the CAC 40 and the FTSE MIB. Now, it was a big week. It was not only a big week for currencies, it was certainly a big week for Treasury. If you look at sterling, let's probably start there because we had GDP better than expected here in the UK. If you look at what Pound's been doing, it's one of the ones that we've been watching for the most. So let's get sterling up. There you go. Pound relatively strong so far. Uh, it's off a recent peak. And of course, this goes into the narrative of we could see some kind of pause which the Bank of England was really at pains in trying to explain the press conference. They didn't say they would pause, but they said what we need to make sure is that these uh, interest rates could actually stay higher for longer. Then the 10-year ending a week, a bit of on a back foot, three big Treasury auctions and a CPI print in the week. The auctions went fine. CPI was also okay. Yesterday's report on U.S. budget balance in July actually showed U.S. deficit at $220 billion versus an estimated 135. The Treasury has had to increase auction size increases. Then a couple of corporate stories. We have Country Garden. This was one of our main stories today. 31% uh, lower on the week. There's been a lot of talk about uh, what this means for bondholders going forward. This is after also uh, Moody's came in and uh, told, uh, well, downgraded a slew of banks. And that was one of the exposures to the commercial real estate, which are seeing cracks continuing in the space in two very different markets. So one's WeWork, down 17% on the week in Country Garden. And then finally, there's one story that we need to also watch out for, and that's Telecom Italia. We understand that there's a blueprint for a deal. KKR uh, would take most of the Telecom Italia network, and then Italy, the Italian government, would have a 20% stake in that as well. For the moment, Telecom Italia gaining 1.7%. We look at oil. It's been a big story this week also because of LNG strikes, possible LNG strikes in Australia. Global oil demand hitting a record. Prices may climb. That's according to the latest IEA. You can see for the moment oil, New York oil, 82.92. Well, American oil. I wouldn't say New York oil. Now, UBS has ended an agreement with the Swiss government to cover its losses it could incur from the rescue of Credit Suisse. It is a sign that the stricken lender's assets might actually be less troublesome than initially thought. For more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Jan Patrick Barnett. JP, thank you so much for joining us. Love the screens behind you. You're like like a, a space shuttle looking at the UBS share price minute by minute. Is this good news just because they've removed themselves a little bit from, from the, the eyes uh, of the politicians and the Swiss government? Yeah, it's absolutely good news, and it's very surprising to me. And it's one of those headlines where you almost spill your coffee over uh, over breakfast, because usually you would think that the bank, especially in this situation, is very careful of giving back such a guarantee and and be a little bit more like let's wait and see. But it looks like that UBS did a very thorough and very fast job in assessing those assets on the Credit Suisse balance sheet. And I guess they had two choices here: either protect the balance sheet or protect the UBS brand. And it seems like that they can, came to the conclusion now that the balance sheet is totally fine and that those assets are. Going Going to be all right in the in the future, so they opted for going the um, to protect the brand or restore some of the the criticism because there was a lot of public outcry that once again you need billions of taxpayer money potentially um, to save a troubled bank 15 years after the financial crisis. So it's a very smart decision for them to say that okay, looks like we don't need it, um, so we give it back. That helps our brand and of course sends a very strong message to shareholders to say like look, all your worries about this share of about this merger that we are now earning the the, the troubles of. Swiss, so to speak, um, uh, is not going to happen, at least for the asset side. So, uh, JP, I mean, the timing, I thought, was quite interesting because on the 31st of August, we're expecting news. There's not only earnings, but really an update on the merger. C could we see something big on the 31st of August, or is this also j just remove themselves ahead of the Swiss election? Like, for me, it means, yes, they haven't found anything too ugly in the Credit Suisse books. They had until mid-June to look through that. But could it be the sense of, of something bigger coming? 
Uh, maybe I'm not 100% sure, but I think like what UBS is trying to do here, and, and I said that from the beginning of the merger, what what's needed now is like a constant stream, a stream of positive news to get this merger going and to keep everybody uh, on board, uh, especially the the shareholders and um, and the government. And we were seeing that already. And um, they gave us a rough timeline timeline very early. And um, they settled some of the legacy legal issues of of Credit Suisse. Now we have the guarantees being um, put back to the government, and I would be um, pretty sure that we get something more on uh, on the earnings day where they will tell us, OK, look, this is where we stand now and that's how we're going to progress with the merger. There's still the big, big topic of how they align all the customers, the, all the programs, all the IT software, all the people uh, in the two banks. Uh, that's still a big issue and that will take time. Uh, but I think UBS is doing the absolute right thing here. It's like um, showing we are going ahead. We are making progress, good progress with the merger. Um, step by step, it's not going to be a like, super fast progress, but they keep us updated, uh, timely with positive news. And if as long as they, they keep doing this um, and show the results, and I think like shareholders will um, rebuild the trust in that this merger is actually beneficial. Thank you so much, JP Barnett. There with the very latest, and I think UBS is gaining some 4%. Now, U.S. core CPI posted the smallest back to back gains in more than two years yesterday. Joining us now to talk about what this means for the Fed and, of course, what it means for the U.S. economy, Bloomberg's Christina Kina and BNP Paribas Asset Management, Global Head of Multi Asset, Maya Bandari. So, thank you both for joining us. Maya, I'm so excited to have you on a big day. I mean, it's been a big week. We had auctions, we had CPI. What does this give us in terms of glimpse into the way forward for the Fed? Uh, well, I mean, I think yesterday's inflation number was certainly uh, was wel welcome news uh, uh, for, for the Fed. I think, uh, I guess, two pieces uh, perhaps that I draw, draw attention to. One was when we look at the, the, the headline number, uh, we saw uh, quite a significant uh, reduction in food away from home, which is one of the more persistent sources of inflation. Uh, so that's back down to its pre-pandemic trend. And then on the core side, which was arguably a bit stickier, over half of it was, a lot of it was shelter, which was up 50%, and we expect that to come down. So uh, I, think, I think broadly the, the inflation news was, was good news uh, for, for, for central banks. I think uh, we believe at, at BNP uh, Paribas Asset Management that we are uh, uh, at, if not very close, uh, to, to peak rates. Uh, the question, of course, is how fast they, they can come down, and, and there we are less sure. And I think the comments you made a moment ago on, on gasoline prices and oil prices are quite prescient, of course, because uh, there's a, a high degree of sensitivity uh, to that uh, in the U.S. Yeah, and Christina, I have thank you for all of the viewers that actually write in. We have a very loyal viewer who I think is based in the U.S. So not only is it 4 a.m., but also he's not on holiday in August. And he's writing in saying, look, the concern of the markets right now is that there's no real catalyst going forward. Where, where will the catalyst be? Well, Francine, yeah, I mean, that is the big question, isn't it? I think what we've kind of uh, been experiencing, especially now, I mean, it's the summer markets. That's one aspect of it, of course. But also this idea that central banks the world over are now telling us that they're data dependent. And so I think that's the trouble with markets is that they really want to latch on to something uh, to be able to kind of prize things off of. But at the moment, it's, it's kind of difficult because we've heard from the Fed, the Bank of England, even the ECB all saying that they're waiting for the data and it's forcing markets to do the same thing. Now, of course, you know, we know what the biggies are, right? We just had the jobs data out of the U.S. And, of course, inflation kind of giving us uh, some encouraging news on the inflation front, but also uh, mixed signals, right? Because I think, you know, as Myra was pointing out, like, there, there were some encouraging signs uh, in terms of cooling inflation. Uh, core, though, looking a little bit sticky and super core, I would note, uh, which is what uh, Jay Powell in particular is looking at. Uh, that has accelerated more than expected. And so there's always this fear that, oh, maybe the Fed is going to have to uh, rethink this idea of, of that peak rate coming sooner or later. And that's something I think we still have rate cut bets priced yeah. uh, in the U.S. And I think that's something that markets are still kind of trying to brace for, even uh, yeah. kind of as an outlier scenario. Yeah, so my, what does that mean for, you know, portfolio construction? Um, yeah, because, I mean, every risk has attached to it a price, right? And I think one of the most striking things, at Francine, at the moment is uh, the disparate pricing uh, between bonds and equities. Uh, when we look at bond premia and compare those with equity premia, uh, you've, got, you've got the biggest gap in, in, in 15 years. In other words, bonds are looking more attractive than they have uh, for, for a good while, uh, really, since the GFC. Uh, and so what we've been doing uh, with this is, is, is really leaning into uh, long-duration positions, uh, very cognizant of, uh, of, of our conversation just now 
around inflation. We've been doing that uh, recently more through through tips. So so long dated uh, inflation protected bonds in the U.S. Where I think you know yields over two percent are attractive. And my, do you look at regionally? Is it like a regional by region? Uh, regional by region. Yes. At the moment, I mean, we have uh, we, we feel perhaps the greatest conviction uh, in, in in the U.S. Uh, so we have uh, long dated tips. We also have uh, some nominal exposure. Uh, but actually, quite recently, we've we've also unhedged our European investment grade uh, uh, long position. In other words, taking the spread risk along with uh, the the duration risk, because of course in Europe uh, the data is is a fair bit a fair bit softer uh, than it is uh, in in the U.S. and uh, and we are a little bit more concerned around around uh, around the growth picture there. And, and Christiano, you've done quite a lot of work on valuations, uh, you know, folks on the U.K. but also in Europe in general. Yeah, absolutely, Francine. I mean, you know the refrain in Europe and the UK, right? It's cheap and therefore it must be a good buy. But I, I do question sometimes the argument around cheapness just because it's probably cheap for a reason. I mean, that's certainly the argument in, in the UK. But you have actually seen kind of uh, a bit of resilience, uh, should we say, in, in, in the UK equity market. Of course, we hit kind of uh, some of those highs that we saw earlier in the summer. We pulled back a little bit from there. Uh, but of course, there is this, this argument to be made that perhaps all the bad news is, is potentially Potentially already in a price. I mean, one thing that we are noticing is that we just keep kind of getting surprised to the upside, uh, perhaps when it comes to the economy in the UK and also the resilience of consumers in particular. And so that certainly bodes well for some of the more consumer focused stocks, not just on the FTSE 100, but also on the domestically focused FTSE 250. And so, yeah, maybe perhaps there's a little bit of um, uh, credence to the, the idea that they are cheap enough that it is potentially a good buy at this stage, especially if there's potential for some of that bad news to fade away slowly. Christine, thank you so much. Christine Aquino, there were the very latest on the markets. Maya, thank you as well. But Maya Mandari from BNP Paribas Asset Management stays with us. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about the UK and the better than expected economic data. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Pulse, everyone. The pound gained after the UK second quarter GDP came in better than estimated thanks to unexpected growth in manufacturing. You can see sterling 127.12 uh, right now. Now, both Bloomberg Economics and Bloomberg Intelligence say that the economy is eking out growth amid rising rates, strengthening their view that the BOE will need to generate more weakness in the economy to tame inflation. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Brendan Scott and still with us, BNP Paribas Asset Management's global head of multi-asset. Maya Bandar. So Maya, thank you so much um, for sticking around. Brendan, you're also our managing editor for UK economics and governments. And I feel like it's it's the, the most fun and difficult job in the world because we're trying to figure out the, the BOE has a tougher time than others. They've probably, you could argue, were late to the game in terms of hiking. So what do they do with this GDP number? I think it's just going to reinforce their view that they're not done hiking yet. Uh, they, it, the markets are still pricing in a hike again of a quarter point in September. This is just going to make that seem more likely. Uh, of course, this is backward looking data. This is this we're talking about the second quarter uh, of this year ending in June. It's, we're, it's already behind us. We've already seen uh, output uh, in PMI slowing down. Uh, we've seen unemployment ticking up. So it's, it seems like we could be on the cusp here. We could be seeing the sort of the end of a pretty good first half. Uh, what happens in the second half of the year still remains to be seen. I, I feel like if you're a central bank nowadays, but especially Bank of England, it's damn if you do and damn if you don't. What, yeah. I mean, is, is there a sub data that they should be looking at to, to try and, and calibrate it so it's just right? Uh, well, I mean, I think the Bank of England faces perhaps the most intense version of, of that pinch point between between growth and, and, and inflation. I mean, there are many differences uh, here with the UK, most notably uh, in the mortgage market and the transmission of, uh, of higher rates to households. Uh, and so I think the bank does need to be uh, quite, quite careful. Uh, uh, again, I think the challenge is a bit higher for the Bank of England than it is for other central banks. Inflation is still a factor of four uh, above, above the target. Uh, but in indeed, I mean, we don't think that the Bank of England uh, should or indeed will just continue to power ahead uh, with rate hikes uh, off the back of certainly today's data, which, as you reflected, is, is very much uh, backward, backward looking. Yeah, it's backward looking, but also the, the, the concern, right, is that we're starting to see a little bit of the impact of how much they've raised rates. Mm -hmm. it, it, is it taking longer than expected to actually you know, filter through the economy? Is this 
the main concern, which is why the BOE is really at pain and saying we could stay at these levels for much longer to just see how it pans out. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, was quite clear in his last uh, public appearance when they were announcing that last quarter point hike that that rates could in, stay higher for longer, that it's going to be a, a long process. Don't get excited about cuts. Even if they can start talking about a pause sometime in the next few months, that the, the discussion of a cut is, is far down the road. So, so what do you do with UK assets? <laughs> this is like the million dollar question. I mean, we had a couple of government ministers also saying, you know, to grow, we're going to get investment. Is, is it attractive at the moment? Um, well, I mean, I think when you talk about UK assets, you need to be careful which UK assets you're talking about. So certainly yeah. things like gilts, for example, are, are things that are very much focused on the UK economy. It's something we like. We like gilts relative yeah. to buns, uh, for example. Uh, but of course, when you get to UK equities, they have very little to do with the UK economy, right? 75% of your revenues on the FTSE 100 come from overseas. And actually on that overseas picture, we're a, bit, a little bit more cautious. You know, this sort of Goldilocks-like Goldilocks -like narrative that seems to be very much uh, the consensus-based case uh, looks a bit complacent uh, to us. And, and we'd see sort of downside risk to growth, um, certainly that narrative uh, in, in most places, uh, including the UK. So, so we'll see. We'll see, right? If they, they've kind of managed this, this big experiment, yeah. what happens now? I mean, so we're looking at inflation, and I think the next time the Bank of England meet, we'll have you know two inflation prints because it's September 21st. Yeah, and not just the, in, the inflation prints. We'll also have wage data, yeah. which could uh, give the bank a clear signal on what's happening on the services side. They're very concerned about rising wages and those uh, those coming down in order to keep the pressure down on certain sectors that are driving up the uh, the CPI. Uh, Maya, d does the ECB have a easier job, and what does that mean for for your? You know, appetite for European or Central European stocks. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think Europe, Europe in a way has has a bit has, has a similar problem in that you know you've got pretty sticky wages, uh, uh, to your point, and that uh, I think is something that the, that the ECB is quite mindful of. Uh, but when it comes to equities, actually, Europe is the area we where we are uh, most cautious uh, at the moment. Uh, I mean, you know, European earnings uh, are expected never never came off and are expected to steadily rise two and a half percent this year, low single digits next year and the year after. And of course, we know that when you have a, a weaker macro outcome, as we expect, earnings actually tend to fall uh, by 10, 15, uh, 20 percent. And so Europe is an area where we are particularly cautious because we see a real, a real disconnect between earnings and, and the macro. Maya, thank you so much. Maya Bandari there and Brendan Scott. Maya is from BNP Paribas Asset Management, where she's global head of multi-assets. And of course, Brendan Scott is our managing editor for UK government and politics. Coming up, crumbling to a penny stock. Country Garden has planned launched about 70% from its January peak as debt concerns grow. We'll have full details on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Chinese property developer Country Garden has become a Hong Kong penny stock amid increasing scrutiny of its operations and mounting liquidity concerns. Now, Country Garden's fall from grace really underscores how a persistent slump in property prices is weighing in on some of China's strongest private builders. Now, for more, we're joined by Rebecca Chung Wilkins, our Asia government and politics correspondent. So, Rebecca, what? I mean, how quickly has that happened? And we had a lot of concerns about this infiltrating or infecting the sector elsewhere. Because it's a penny stock, is, is that concern now removed? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think more broadly, the bigger question of whether we actually see a default by Country Garden is still up in the air. Um, they've got about three, four more weeks to figure out if they can pay this coupon. It's about 23 million across two different bonds. Um, but if you look at how the uh, firm is being priced, both in the bonds and with that penny stock too, you can see they're not, people are not just pricing in a default but also very low chances of any kind of recovery, something around seven cents, six cents on the dollar here on their dollar notes. And Rebecca, I mean, it's really incredible. This is our big number of the day, and it's $47 billion, $47 billion. This is the market cap that Country Garden has lost since its peak in 2018. What does that mean for the government and their future support of the sector? 
Yeah, it is extraordinary. When I first started covering Country Garden about three years ago, it was trying to large as developer by sales. Now, the interesting thing, although it's a lot a loss of its market cap, it's still a very big player in China, about number six. Um, and it's got a lot of pre-sold units that it will need to deliver. So in China, people tend to buy their properties before they're built, before they're actually uh, given. Um, when we saw Evergrande default, there was this quite a sort of pressing issue of mortgage boycotts. Essentially, uh, Evergrande's operations in some parts ground to a halt and people that had bought homes didn't get them delivered. Now, this social unrest issue is going to be prevalent and top of mind for Beijing. About 100, uh, sorry, excuse me, about 80 million square feet in unfinished homes that it needs to complete. So it is a bit of a challenge. And a lot of this is also spread over quite a large area in China also in these lower tier cities where we're not expecting that easing of policy uh, by Beijing to help boost the property market. We're not really expecting those policies to touch those lower tier cities. So it is really a challenge for policymakers here. Rebecca, thank you so much, as always, for all of your insight and wisdom. Rebecca Ching Wilkins in Hong Kong. Coming up, UBS says it's voluntarily ending the 9 billion Swiss franc government loss protection. We'll have more on why the Swiss lender has done this and really why now. This is Bloomberg. UBS scraps the Swiss government backstops that helped seal its Credit Suisse takeover, including a 9 billion franc loss protection deal. U.S. core CPI posts the smallest back-to-back -back gains in more than two years, raising prospects of a Fed pause, plus the U.K. economy surprises with the strongest quarterly growth in more than a year. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, UBS has ended an agreement with the Swiss government to cover losses it could incur from the rescue of Credit Suisse. It's a sign that the stricken lender's assets might actually be less troublesome than initially thought. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Marion Haltofmeyer in Zurich, who's been on top of the story from the very beginning. Marion, you're really the person that I wanted to call this morning at 5 a.m. Like, why did UBS do this? This is really a show of strength for them in this deal, right? They are on track and they're saying, you know what, actually, we, we did the due diligence now because in March when there was this rescue deal, they didn't have the time to look at everything going on in credit fees. But now they said, you know, we've looked at it, we think we can handle it, and we don't need your government support. Now, this also helps them move forward without a lot of the public discussion and the court of public opinion on are we going to have to support this transaction in the same way that the Swiss taxpayers were asked to support state bailouts back in this financial crisis in 2008. On the, on the other hand, it also allows them to move forward in the vein that this is a purely commercial transaction now. They don't have to report back to the government on what they're going to be making losses on anymore because the government's not paying for it anymore. And so what does this actually mean for the, for the integration of Credit Suisse? And could this give them a lot more run, runway of deciding on you know, some of the more contentious issues with the Swiss Universal Bank? Or is it just putting that distance in an election year in Switzerland? It definitely helps put that distance. In terms of the integration, um, it, they, they sort of say it's not necessarily related to the Swiss unit um, decision. So, of course, we're still waiting whether or not they're keeping that Credit Suisse domestic retail banking operations or whether there's a plan to IPO it or carve it out. Um, that decision we'll, we'll get more information on at the end of the month and over the course of the next quarter. Um, but it is really a good sign that they're moving fast, they're, they're on track, and that they have a plan. So hopefully we'll get more details on that coming soon. So, Marion, what role will the Swiss government and the finance ministry play going forward? So UBS still has some leniency in terms of capital ratios and, and different regulatory metrics. So they'll still have to be survey, surveying what UBS is doing in the sense that they're the regulator. And this is obviously a, a highly watched deal. Um, but in terms of the government actually being involved in deciding on how things are wound down um, at, uh, from parts of Credit Suisse, there will be less involvement and UBS can really move forward and not necessarily be held back by what might be some political decisions or some political pressure. Marion, very quickly, I mean, why did they do it now and not August 31st? I know we're all, you know, gearing up for the earnings results on August 31st. We could potentially see a lot more news out there on the merger and other things. Was it smart to do it ahead of that? 
I think they're taking the approach that the, the better they, they can communicate information, the better it is for analysts, investors, the public um, to really assess whether this is going to be a good thing or not. And they, that is the onus. You know, that is the chairman and the CEO. They will have to prove that they made the right decision. And so the more they can come out with information as fast as possible and that information that shows strength, the better for them and the better for, for the share price. You'll see the shares have gone up a lot today. Yeah, they're up some 4%. Marion, as always, thank you so much. Marion Halstofmeyer there in Zurich. Now, fund managers relying on ESG scores to weigh portfolios might be undermining their own efforts to cut carbon emissions. At least that's according to a recent study from investment service venture Scientific, Scientific Beta. Now, researchers found that 92% of the reduction that investors can achieve by solely weighting stocks to minimize carbon intensity is lost when incorporating broader ESG scores. The findings add to the growing scrutiny of the ESG ratings industry. Well, joining us now is Yuko Takano, senior investment manager at Pictet Asset Management. Yuko, as always, thank you for joining us. It just feels like the ESG debate is really more raging than before. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? People are weighing in, especially from the U.S. investors. You have cared about this for a long time. Like, What does it mean for an investor be, being now ESG invested? I think that um, the main issue, and it has been for a while in this industry, is that uh, you know, as a pretty quick solution to creating or managing ESG funds, investors tended to really rely on these ESG scoring methods, which is, you know, first of all, it, it's backward looking. Um, and so, as investors, you always need to be looking into the future and how a company is transitioning, like where are the emissions going, rather than looking at the present. Um, at looking at the present, um, and I think what's really distorted the market is, um, you know, the the existence of these scoring, which is you know very it's it's necessary. It's like a rating agency, but to kind of solely rely on that and to make your investment decisions or allocation decisions based on that, I think is a huge issue, and I think that's why all of these issues have been starting to come up. So, so how do you allocate? How, you know, what what kind of research do you do to make sure that you know there's no to little greenwashing, yeah. and that investors can be confident? In, in what the new generation, I guess, of ESG products bring? Um, so I think the number one solution to all of this, um, especially as active equity investors, um, and I think this is really a point where we can make a difference um, as active equity investors is to do fundamental analysis. Like, you know, in our case, our portfolio is extremely concentrated. It's a 40 stock portfolio. We know every single one of our companies. We can do deep research into them. And so I think for those investors who are willing to put in that effort and to manage their funds in that type of way, um, this could be very good because, you know, ESG is here to stay. Um, a lot of these factors are important in investing and making high returns. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, we do look at the scoring. Um, we do see that as a type of data point, uh, but we don't rely on that. And I think that's really important going forward. Um, you, I mean, given all, also that, you know, I guess through the political lens and people looking at ESG, mm -hmm. do you think the trend will accelerate? You say ESG is here to stay and there's no doubt about it, mm -hmm. but I wonder whether it's going to take a back step or yeah. do you see the fundamentals in the companies that you cover and, and study deeply actually being accelerated? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it definitely ebbs and flows. Um, and unfortunately, um, some investors do tend to decide their stance on ESG based on their political beliefs. Um, but uh, in the long run, uh, you know, you just spoke about the U.S. market, for example. When we look at the U.S., our U.S. clients, there are a broad range of clients. Um, and, you know, some really think that this is the way forward, others not so much, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's kind of very similar to making a decision between you know, value and growth or fixed, in or fixed income and equities. It's an allocation decision for them. Um, so for us, it's you know, what really matters is to do the best job that we can possible. But you know, if you look on the car corporate side, um, ESG is definitely way, way higher up on the corporate agenda than maybe even compared to two years ago. So I do think that this is here to stay. And if there's one corporate in a sector, does it kind of incentivize the rest of the sector to go in? Are you like adding, if you have yeah. a portfolio, I guess, of 40 companies, yeah. do, do you add and remove them? Or yeah. is it just analyzing those? I mean, how much um, do they fluctuate? So, um, I mean, we're long-term investors, yeah. so we do have a pretty long holding period, three to five years, sometimes mm -hmm. 10 is what we aim for, you know, if you find that really good company. Um, but obviously, um, on the corporate side, uh, what we do is engagement. So what we do when we see a company that is is, you know, there could be a company that's top-notch in engagement.
engagement and top notch in ESG, and then there could be laggards. And we really think that laggards are very interesting because they're on the path to transition. And so what we do with them is we approach them and we say, look, this is what the best in class is doing. Why don't you do the same? Because it will change your, the perception of your company. And is I think it, that's one way to approach it. You, is, is there an industry actually that you think you know maybe hasn't been getting a lot of love mm -hmm. you know, from ESG investors that should, that, that is actually making yeah. meaningful progress? Um, definitely in the energy sector, there are companies that are doing really interesting things, um, not necessarily in oil and gas per se, but um, you know we've looked at some companies in oil services that have really interesting compression technology that can be applied to other renewables or other sources of energy, not just oil and gas. So we think that sector is really, really interesting. In general, these cor corporates, of course, are also, I guess, interest rate dependent. Yeah. I mean, how much do you look at what the Fed and, and the, the uh, you know, inflation trajectory looks yeah. like? Yeah. I mean, we do look at it, um, especially in terms of input costs. I mean, that's a really big factor when we make investment decisions. Um, and so what we look at is, um, you know, pricing power of these companies, how unique their products are, um, how much pricing power do they have over their clients. And that, I think that's the most important thing. Um, I think the Fed is very prudent in terms of, you know, trying to manage the inflation. But, uh, you know, obviously the Fed is not working for the markets. They're working for um, uh, U.S. citizens. So, you know, we can't really control that. We, we cannot. Yuko, Yuko, <laughs> thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Yuko Takano, their senior investment manager at Pictay Asset Management. Now, we're just getting some breaking news out of China. China is actually posting its lowest new yuan loans since July of 2009. Now, we'll dig into deeper into why uh, these are some of the underlying reasons. We have this week followed very closely about potential, if not default, certainly creditors not being paid coupons on time in the real estate market. Uh, this feels like something a little bit different. China just coming out, for example, the aggregate financing. That's half of the estimate. And actually, the new yuan loans, that's also half of what was estimated. So does that mean that they're trying to maybe take a little bit of, of that bubble out of the economy? We'll look into that. And of course, we'll see how the markets open come Monday. Coming up, KKR signs a preliminary agreement with Italy's economy minister or ministry that could give the government as much as 20 percent in Telecom Italia. So we'll bring you all the details next. And this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, U.S. private equity firm KKR has signed a preliminary agreement with Italy's finance ministry that could give the Italian government as much as 20 percent stake in Telecom Italia. Now, this comes as the phone network all looks, looks set to sell assets to reduce its debt pile. Now, the announcement marks the second major move by the Italian prime minister, Giorgia Meloni, after the surprise plan for a windfall tax on banks. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Alice Alessandra Migliaccio, who's been covering this. Alessandra, thank you for joining us. Happy August. Uh, tell us more about this deal and how significant is it for the Italian government? Well, it's pretty significant. Um, it's interesting that the, there aren't a lot of details about the deal. I mean, the, the press release says um, that the terms of the offer foresee a decisive role for the government in defining strategic choices, and I quote. So, I mean, basically, look, it's about the Italian government having a say in everything that happens in corporate Italy. So it's very interesting for investors, I think, and for all of us to realize, I mean, not that we had that many doubts given the nature of this type of government, but she wants to be involved in every step of the process in future in companies like Telecom Italia and beyond. So, I mean, why? Is this to have control? Is it, to, is it a... a populist move to show the people that they're not letting go? Is it anti-corporate? Like, what are the underlying reasons? Yeah, there are there are a lot of reasons. I mean, one of the things is the history of the party. I mean, she does come from a former fascist party uh, that has a history of not trusting um, capitalism, essentially. I mean, she believes that the state needs to be involved in every part of the process, in every kind of decision, and it needs to. It, it's a form, you know, in France, it's called dirigisme. You can call it interventionism. Um, she basically uh, also, you know, she got lucky when she was, uh, when she first arrived, she was able to nominate all the new state company heads. She did that. And now she's moving in on all the big corporate decisions. Anything she deems strategic, 
And there are a lot of things she deems strategic, from aerospace to uh, communications to networks to grids to energy. She says, OK, you know, do whatever you like, make money. I'm not going to redistribute it. She's not necessarily a communist. She's the regist. She wants the government to have a say, to decide, to say if it's OK or not. And she does this by taking stakes, by having golden powers over certain things. I mean, she recently, just this week, passed a norm saying technology transfers, even within your own company, need to be approved by the state if they're outside of the EU, just to give an example. And there are tons of examples. So mm. it's part of her DNA. She doesn't trust the process, sure. the capitalist process. So, Alison, I mean, after that, you know, fr frankly, the shock of the windfall tax on banks that no one was expecting, which then they walked out. Are there other big portfolios or industries that could be touched by the government in the next six months? Like, what's next? Right. I mean, that's obviously the question. I think any state company, uh, because, of course, you know, Italy, we have to clarify one thing. Italy has always had state companies. The biggest and most important ones are actually state controlled. But... It had a little bit more of a laissez-faire attitude. The difference now is she wants to micromanage. I mean, I'll give you an example. Terna, the grid operator, very recently, she summoned the CEO to discuss the departure of some middle managers. That's how my, you know, microscopic the control is. She's, she's a micromanager. Um, in the future, we might see this in the fields are essentially that she's identified her energy, um, artificial intelligence, uh, semiconductors. You know, anything that grids, all kinds of grids, telecommunications, so anything that she thinks could be strategic for the country, but that's pretty broad, she will be involved in. Okay, so interesting. Thank you so much, Alessandra Migliaccio, there with the very latest, of course, on Italy and this move by the government for Telecom Italia and KKR. Now, some bad news. Hold on tight, fasten your seatbelt. Bad news for pizza lovers. The cost of making a classic pizza margarita at home rose at more than twice the pace of overall inflation in Italy last month. And that's because of olive oil. Olive oil prices have soared by close to one third. Now, the essential cooking oil found in most, if not all, Italian kitchens saw the biggest increase among the staples tracked by Bloomberg's pizza index. Now, the overall cost of making a pizza in July rose 13.5% from a year earlier, compared with a national inflation rate of just under 6%. A devastating drought in Spain, the world's biggest producer of olive oil, has actually caused a spike in prices at a time of dry conditions across the Mediterranean. Now, we'll have plenty more on China. We had breaking news in the last couple of minutes. China actually posting its lowest new yuan loans since uh, July 2009. What that means is that we could see a significant slowing economy as consumers but businesses take out less loans than expected. We'll have a full roundup of what it means for the China economy. This is Bloomberg. I like real businesses, real clients, real revenues, real profits. James Gorman is the longtime CEO of Morgan Stanley. In May 2023, the Australia-born Gorman said he plans to retire sometime in the next year. Morgan Stanley shareholders were disappointed. The stock fell on the news. So the question now is whether Morgan Stanley's next leader can build on Gorman's turnaround success. The three internal candidates are co-president Ted Pick. He's the head of institutional securities. Co-president Andy Saperstein. He's the head of wealth management and Dan Simkowitz, the head of investment management. Whoever the board chooses, analysts say the quicker the handoff, the better to prevent political infighting that would distract from longer term goals. The next CEO skill set must include the ability to deal with liquidity that's likely to be stressed and money that will cost more. And U.S. regulators are monitoring big companies getting bigger. Risk management will also matter, especially for globally systemic important banks like Morgan Stanley. Remember, it was also James Gorman's personality. He had the charisma to bring two sides of a bank with very different cultures, investment management and trading all together. The next person will have to do the same while setting the bar even higher for Morgan Stanley. Well, Shanali Bazak and Scarlett Fu with a look at what might be next for Morgan Stanley once James Gorman actually departs as chief executive officer. Now, China's latest monthly new yuan loans have dropped to the lowest since 2009. For team analysis, let's get straight to Bloomberg's Valerie Titel and Tom McKenzie. Thank you both. I mean, this is a huge deal. Tom, thank you so much for flagging it because that headline crossed the Bloomberg terminal. I mean, yeah. how, how bad does this look for the Chinese economy? Well, this really jumped out to me because as Hao Hong, who's a really close 
watcher of the Chinese economy, formerly of BOCOM, and an analyst there, said to me, look, even if you get that fiscal impulse from regulators, from the PBOC, from the finance ministry that so many people are calling out for, there isn't necessarily the demand to take it up. And that's what you're seeing from these new yuan loans coming in at less than half the estimates at those 2009 loans. Businesses, corporations and households are seeing so much uncertainty, there is so much angst, they are not willing to take on this additional debt. They don't see a clear path to further growth. And that is the concern for policymakers. Even if they come through with the big guns on fiscal stimulus, who's going to take it up? Yeah, and this just adds to a raft of negative data that we've had on China. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of negative data on China and all these grumblings about Country Garden, what's going on in the property development market there. But I think the market really is going to jump to some big conclusion about this being a real potential risk to global growth. You know, we're at the end of the Fed cycle nearly. We're always looking out for what's going to end it. What's the next crisis that could end it? Mm -hmm. Potentially, it could be a financial crisis in China. Are these the early grumblings of a big upset in Chinese growth? So it's unclear. I mean, could we see like a frozen? I mean, if people are not asking for loans is it because they're really worried about what's ahead and so everything grinds to a halt and yeah. we've been hoping for PBOC to intervene is this finally the time where we're going to see something from policymakers yeah I mean that is the call from so many analysts isn't it that they need to do more they need to stop up either with benchmark rate cuts further rate cuts further cuts to the triple R the reserve ratio for banks or additional fiscal support whether that's to households or businesses but again it points to the fact that unless you get that momentum going the mindset shift across Chinese businesses and households around additional optimism that's not there at the moment it's not going to work and the real estate story ties into this don't forget it's about 20 percent of GDP if you lock everything in together and the real estate story is tied to the banking story they're on the hook for credit losses of around 260 billion dollars potentially according to Goldman Sachs the Chinese banking system and again real estate links into what's happening in the local government level they are short of cash China is now trying to shuffle the debt between local provinces and their local government financing vehicles the infrastructure impulse isn't there there are no big ticket projects for them to build out in terms of infrastructure railways and roads that's all being done so again the levers for them to pull and the creative policy making isn't coming through yet from Beijing. And, and this matters for the rest of the world. It especially matters for the ECB and actually in Europe because of the closer links. Yeah, cl the close economic links, but also uh, China exports uh, goods deflation. This could possibly mean we could be uh, receiving deflation from China in a very strong way. I know that uh, goods deflation has been declining in Europe and in the U.S. for a long time, but possibly that could uh, be sustained through next year and, and help the ECB and the Fed get inflation back to target. There you go. Team analysis. Everything you wanted to know about these new loans actually plunging to 2009 lows with Tom McKenzie and Valerie Titel. Thank you both for joining us. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Kriti Gupta in New York, Danny Berger in London. They'll have plenty more on China. Of course, it's been a big week for Treasuries. We had a lot of data out there. And then that big story in the banking sector with UBS. You'll have full coverage up next. Happy Friday, everyone. This is Bloomberg.